If you divorce me, I will ruin your life. And I know how to do it. Well, she sure got that right. Nobody knows how to hurt us better than family. When I stood here, it seems like a long time ago. I guess it is. And when I stood here three weeks ago, and I told God I actually didn't know what to say. I wasn't kidding. Uh, you know, I am positive that when this is all over and I go back and I watch court TV, which I have not done because I know I'd be mortified, there's going to be a million people out there who say, what in the world is that guy doing saying? He doesn't know what to say. But With a case like this, with facts like this, it's hard to know when to start, where to start, where to stop. The judge told you that he'll give me a warning if I go too long. I don't think I'm going to go too long. But you know, we probably could. We could probably talk about this all day. And I kind of think you've heard a lot. You've been here weeks. I've been thinking about this and working on this for two years. And Chris has been dealing with this situation for longer than that. In trying to get ready for today, in trying to get ready for living here in a hotel and trying to explain all of this uh, sometimes frankly uh, it's it's overwhelming and and frankly a little bit scary we have tried to do our best to make sure that you understand as much evidence we can get in here, as much as we can, and as best as we can. And I've been worried that our efforts weren't enough. You know, we came in here and tried to get everything ready. We got Chris his old suit, which he doesn't fit in anymore. As he's been living in jail. We bought him, his old shoes fell apart. I don't know if you noticed. So we bought him new shoes yesterday. Squeaking the whole way up here and squeaking the whole way back. And I'm sorry we laughed at you. But I don't want you to think that I am in any way saying that we're giving up. I'm not in any way saying that what we did and all, all the words that have come out in this courtroom are not important. They're critically important. And I'm so glad there's 12 of you so that maybe if one person didn't hear something, somebody else did. And you took great notes. I mean, I don't know what your notes look like, but you all were taking notes. And as the judge said, you know, that's one way to, to be aware that the jury's working hard too. I have, uh, I have three dogs and Obviously, they're not here in a hotel room with me. They're with, they're with my wife. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I'd, I'd rather be home with them. And it's been hard to be 
separated from them for, for three weeks. But every time I think about that, I remember that Chris has been separated from his family for years. So what is this case really about? What have we seen? What has the evidence been on the witness stand? The evidence in this case that I have seen comes in three parts. It's planted evidence, it's desperate evidence, and in the long run, it's no evidence. That's important to understand because the judge just read you the instructions, and the instructions that the judge read you are the law of Kentucky. That's the actual law. You can depend on the instructions the judge gave you, and you'll have it. The judge read them out loud, but you'll have them. You'll have a hard copy of them back there. The reason I say that is because in their opening, and perhaps in their closing, the prosecution said the important thing is motive means an opportunity. Now, I want to point out to you that you did not hear those words from the judge. That is not Kentucky law. That is not a test. That is not an element. That is not something you look through those instructions. You will not find them in there. The instructions from the court reflect the actual law of Kentucky and tell you, help you in your job to reach a verdict in this case. Because the prosecution wants you to guess. They do. They want you to guess. And that is not the law in the United States. It's not the law in Kentucky. It's not the law that the judge read. If you look at those instructions, they say the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Chris did it. <laughs> That's what the instructions say. That's the law. Not speculation, not maybe some other phantom person out there in the world, but the prosecutor bears the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Chris did this, and they can't, and they haven't, because he did not do this. Now, if we want to talk for a second about motive, means, and opportunity, which are not elements in this case. I'll talk about it for a minute. The prosecution said that the motive was that Calvin Phillips was the prosecution's star witness in this court martial proceeding. But you heard from the witness stand that he was not. You heard from the witness stand that, in fact, he was a witness that was going to help uh, with maybe chain of custody of items. And all those items still came in. You heard Mr. Garrett testify from the witness stand that every single item that he would have been testing about, testifying about came into evidence. But more importantly, critically, what he did not mention until I asked him was that, in fact, the defense wanted him there as a witness, that the defense had said subpoena him there as a witness, that he had been subpoenaed as a defense witness. Now, we can debate the wisdom of the court-martial trial strategy, if you want, but that's not why we're here. But Chris wanted him there at that court-martial because he would be able to give a different version than Jones' version. He'd be able to say what 
was the real circumstances under which those items for the court martial were found. That was critical because we've heard from multiple witnesses about the way Joan does business. This is not some situation where, where Chris got up and said, oh, let me tell you about Joan, and otherwise we didn't hear anything. We heard about Joan and Joan's behavior and Joan's actions from multiple witnesses. It's not in dispute. And I'm going to talk more about her. When we talk about means, I guess we're talking about the Glock firearm. We're going to talk a lot about that. But we know that this is a gun that was also used by Joan. We know it's a gun that was also accessible by Joan. So the means component, the means doesn't carry the weight that they suggest. And we haven't even talked about the shell casing. Because that shell casing is the sort of suspect evidence that only happens in a movie. Except, unfortunately, this is real life. An opportunity, I'm sorry, I don't want to leave opportunity out. The opportunity is that with someone who actually is on video a lot and using cell phone and doing all sorts of other things a lot has some small gaps. Not at the right times, though, but has some small gaps. You know what a gap is? That's a time when you don't have to be using your phone. Now, my 15-year-old daughter uses her phone a lot. Right. I'm in my 50s. Chris is in his 50s. I can go an awful long time without using my phone. And I have to use it for work. I still go a long time. An hour gap when you're at home trying to celebrate your anniversary with Laura is not a long time. In fact, that it was only an hour gap here or an hour gap there should have been longer. The idea that that creates opportunity means it creates opportunity for everybody. A million people have that opportunity. You know, if you only look at one person, if you're really focused on one person, you can find things to say, but that doesn't make it so. <coughs> The reason, at the end of the day, there's no evidence against Chris is because Chris did not commit the crime. And they're the ones who were supposed to come into this courtroom and prove beyond a reasonable doubt to you, and they have not. So, I told you in the opening, that you would be able to hold in your hand a piece of evidence that would be introduced that would let you know that Chris did not do this. It's exhibit one. When I was talking about the shell casing a minute ago, I said that's the sort of thing that only happens in a movie. You know what? The most ridiculous piece of evidence I've ever heard in my life. The most obviously planted thing I've ever seen is this. It is actually ridiculous.
Chris has had 30 years worth of dog tags. They have gone where dog tags go. Some go to family, some get lost, some go into storage. But Chris told you that just like everyone I've ever seen who has dog tags in the military, they come in a pair, they're on a chain. Chris has a rubber sort of bumper thing around his. None of those things are true on this. But that's not what makes it so ridiculous. Whoever left this at the Phillips home has seen too many movies. This was on a shelf next to Calvin Phillips' wallet. Not only is it planted, but it's planted by someone who thinks they're clever, whose reasoning is the same reasoning as one of my kids. Because if you are killing Calvin Phillips, and you want people to think it is Christian Martin, what better way than to bring this item and place it there next to the wallet of the man you've just killed? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. The prosecution didn't even really have an explanation for it, because there is no explanation for it. Are they really suggesting that this was a plan, and that somehow, after committing a murder, Chris would have left his own dog tag at the scene? after placing it next to the wallet of Mr. Phillips. It's ridiculous. And not only is it ridiculous, but it lets us know something. It lets us know that evidence was planted. And once you know that evidence was planted, then you know that Chris didn't do this. But you can hold it. You can talk about it, you will, or you won't. But it is truly mind-boggling. Because we know, one thing we know we heard from multiple witnesses, is that Joan went into the house, their shared house, and took everything out. We know that she took out containers of goods. We know that she turned some of those over, according to her, right, to the folks from the army. Whether as a gift, whether picking it up, or whether it was in storage. Joan had years to have one of these in her possession. And once she took everything out of the house, she pretty much automatically had one or more in her possession. But let's talk about other things at the scene that make it pretty clear that someone was staging. And, and I want to be clear, when I say someone's staging, I'm not talking about the police. Right? This is not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the police went to the scene and, and did anything 
anything wrong. We're going to talk a little bit about their investigation things, but I just want to make sure that's clear. But when you, you got to see the video the other day, and you also saw photos, another thing I want to point out to you is that there was a desk. It was a, it was a desk with a lot of stuff on it. My desk is messy at home. It was a very messy desk. But you know what? Right at the top, on the very top, fanned out to be very visible, was this. And you saw it in evidence. It was a photo, and it was on the video. Someone had placed this subpoena on the very top and fanned it out. Nice and neat. But the prosecution is going to say, this is shell case. This shell case. And it's been tested. This shell case right here matches Chris's clock. And it does. We had to test it too, right? Because that's what, what you do. We hired somebody to go test it. You saw him, he came in. I didn't have to put him on, he agreed. This matches. But what does that actually tell us? This shell could have been fired months earlier or even a year earlier. We don't know when it was fired. We do know that Joan had access to that gun. And in fact, because it was kept in the uh, vehicle that was purchased when she and Chris were together, she even has a key. Unfortunately, she had access to that Glock firearm all the way up until the 19th when it got put into the gun safe. But we also know that she had fired it before. And that she shot in Calvin's backyard. Chris had shot in Calvin's backyard, not as much as Joan. Some people collect brass. And I, shouldn't, I, mean, I should be careful when I say brass. That's a term I use when I'm talking about um, shell casings, but given the metal in this case, I'm not going to use it again. Some people collect shells. They collect them for doing reloads and all manner of things. Right? This single shell matches. But the bullets that killed Calvin Phillips were a special kind of round. You've heard that, that the G2 RIP rounds. And there's no way to know if this held it. In fact, we heard evidence that makes it sound like it probably didn't. So if this didn't, even hold a G2 RIP round. What's it doing on the porch? An interesting thing that Detective Reed said, and you may or may not have noticed this, he said it on the witness stand. He said, I didn't really search the back porch super well. I don't remember the exact quote, but that's what he said. He said, I didn't. He, that he, 
He, the detective on the day when he went out on the 19th, he said he didn't perform um, a, uh, an in-depth search of the back porch himself. And he was asked why. And he said because he did not think anyone was shot there. There's no evidence that the Glock was even shot on that back porch. There's no evidence that um, from Mr. Phillips that there was what was called stippling. I heard that from the medical examiner. So there's no evidence of a close shot that's pretty tight quarters in that back porch. More importantly, we also heard that if he had been killed on that back porch, we would have expected to see a large amount of blood. And there was not. There's no evidence that he was shot on that porch. So why is this shelving? Now when I say that there's no evidence this is an RIP G2 round, remember that one of the reasons for that is that all those rounds are nickel, nickel. Not this one. I'm not trying to say it's impossible, but it's certainly unlikely. You've heard testimony that uh, looking through all the databases, looking through um, everything they had online, looking at the actual bullets that are for sale, looking at the bullets that the Sheriff's Department bought for their test fires, they're all nickel, nickel. So maybe this is the fluke. It's not very likely. So why is it on the back porch? Well, I want to suggest to you that someone who was in possession of a shell which had been fired from the block maybe didn't have that many. Or maybe didn't know that nickel nickel would have been the smarter Play. Put it there. Put it there so that five months later it could be found. Am I saying it was put there the day of? I actually don't think it was. I think it was put there later. I think it was put there later when lo and behold, there is no arrest. Why no arrest? I mean, I left a dog tag. No arrest. So this became the icing on the cake. The non-existent cake. But how could it have gone on the back porch? We heard so much talk about when the back porch got locked or didn't lock back and forth. Your memories will serve you in that regard. But I want to point out a few things. One is that the Durham family, who is a motivated family, you heard folks get on this witness stand and testify, had keys to the house. We also know that Ken Buckner was doing work on the house, and he stopped doing work because he said, I don't like it when I come back, things have been moved. And Buckner said it wasn't secure. But you know what else? You know what's right next to where that shell was found? On well, the back wall back wall of that porch. Now sometimes when evidence is coming in, it's one of the reasons, and I wasn't kidding, it's one of the reasons why there's 12. There are absolutely things that folks miss. But one thing 
that I want to make sure you don't miss. And it was on the video. And it's plain as day. Is that right next, and I'm showing you, these are exhibits you'll have. 107, 105, 108. You see right there, right next to where the bullet was found, lattice with open holes. Open hole lattice. You don't have to take my word for it. These are photos taken by the police. And they show it clear as day. This is the back wall of the porch that goes outside. This is where the shell casing is found. Lattice goes all the way down. And here's a more of a distant shot. Because the lattice goes all the way down and around that exterior door. Now I've had lattice like that on my house. When I was a kid. Here's another one I got. It's not perfect, but it shows it at night. It's a shot taken of the backyard. Um, I, it's a, uh, exhibit 71. And the reason I want to show you that is because it also this is the back door, and then you can see the lattice right next to it. Okay. Those lattice holes. About to get big. I'm not doing it perfect, but you know what I mean. And they're top to bottom. This goes through a hole in the lattice. Super easy. It would not be a problem at all for someone to walk up to that back porch in the backyard right next to that door and just pop this through. There's not one hole to do it. There's not 10 holes to do it. There's not 100 holes to do it. There are hundreds of holes to do it. How did it get back there? That's probably the easiest one. And that happening after the 19th is probably what happened. And I say after the 19th, after the, the police finished their investigation. But I don't know that. That's what I think. Because even if Detective Reed didn't do, at, and what, as he testified, didn't do a thorough search, they're the police. They're looking around. There's a lot of police officers in there. And I want to give them credit. I think they would have found it. <coughs> Michelle, there. One other thing. It was the first witness in the entire case. Right. Ms. Phillips from New Jersey. She said that she thought the shell was under a piece of wood. But that's not really a likely event either, because if there had been a shell fired, and if that wood had laid there that whole time, it would be pretty unlikely for a shell to be under piece of wood. I think it's exactly what she described as she was moving things, the shell, which had been placed on the porch, fell out. Placed by somebody. There's a video camera back there and it's pointed away from the exterior door and away from where the shell was recovered. It is not the most helpful video camera that I've ever seen. But in the final analysis, this doesn't match the actual bullets 
that killed Calvin Phillips. This shows up mysteriously five months later. And this is in a spot where there's no evidence that someone was actually shot. So why is it on the porch? It's on the porch to try and get Chris charged. And in 2019, it succeeds. Let's talk about Joan for a sec. I sure wish we had seen her on this witness stand. I want to suggest perhaps the prosecutor will say the same thing. She has a lot to answer for. There are a lot of questions that would have been helpful for you to hear the answers to. So Joan, what do we know about Joan? Joan makes threats. And those are not distant threats that are unconnected over time. There is a constant presence of Joan, malicious presence of Joan, in Chris's life after they split up. She is not happy. We heard she was prosecuted. She doesn't get uh, benefits because it turns out that their marriage was invalid because she was married to another guy. This is not somebody with a whole lot of credibility. She puts Calvin Phillips up to approaching the military authorities with this evidence. And she goes, you heard, to civilian and military authorities who's trying and trying and trying and complaining, and one sticks. Because she's going to ruin his life. And it sticks. And then, I think, she starts to realize that it's not going to work as well as she thought. You know, whoever did this is the sort of person who thinks in simple ways. Like you can just plant a dog tag with somebody's name. It's like maybe your driver's license. Just take out the subpoena and spread it. What else do we know, though? Right? We know that Joan has the phone. It would have been nice to hear an explanation from Joan. To be honest, I don't think it would have been an honest explanation. But it would have been nice to hear. But we know from the expert that it is not difficult to blank out a phone. All right, we've heard that. You can Google it online, figure out how to do it. Or you can hit the code multiple times. And if you hit the wrong code enough times, I think he said 10, I'm not sure. It's restored to factory settings. And we know that's what happened. So this restored to factory settings phone is brought in by Joan to the store. Not brought to the police, 
right, brought to the store. And when they say they're calling the police, Joan hightails it out of there. She doesn't stick around. We got to see it on the video. She hits the road. We also know that that phone was in the area of her house, over by Elton and Todd County. It was there on the 19th. How do we know that? The prosecution helped us out. Pointed out that it actually was hitting off multiple towers at the same time. We asked the expert, how does that happen? He said, oh, if you have it in, in the middle spot, right, where there's things overlapping, it hit off two towers at the same time. Not only is that important because it lets us know that it's near Joan, but also we know that at the same time, Chris is doing normal stuff. He's going to work. And he goes, he's at work for a while. And then he run, goes and runs an errand to Hopkinsville and drops off money for his, uh, his divorce lawyer. Or I shouldn't say divorce. Disillusion. Can't get divorced if you were never really married. And he's changing out his car for a minute. And goes and picks up uh, Emma and drives up their horseback. All that stuff. There's cell phone records, there's location records. And in the meantime, somewhere else. Over by Elton, his pants phone. Him old phones. Joan had the phone. There's no question Joan had the phone. Joan came in with the phone and brought it to the AT&T store. I want to suggest to you that the same sort of person who kept this trophy might have thought that the best way to make sure that that phone was no longer anywhere usable for evidence at all might have been to have it converted to her use. I don't know that because we didn't have her on the witness stand. Did she ask them to restart the phone for her? Did she say she just bought it? Did she say, oops, my kids hit the wrong code too many times? I don't know. It will not surprise you that Joan has not talked to me. We know that she's lied. We know she's done, she's abused animals. We know that she is someone, the exact sort of someone, who would be involved in this. And let me be clear. The Phillips family has been through a terrible ordeal. When I say that Chris did not commit this murder, that doesn't take away from the fact that, that Calvin Phillips and Pamela Phillips were murdered. That Danzer was murdered. Not for one second am I suggesting that that didn't happen or that that is not terrible. It's terrible. But that doesn't mean that you convict someone who didn't do it. That doesn't mean that you convict someone when there's no evidence. That's not how we do things. The Phelps family has been through a lot. And they're here. And I'm sorry. 
because I can't imagine, I really can't, what that must be like. And they didn't want to talk to me before drowning out like no. And they have been trying to get Chris charged. Because they think he's they think he's guilty. And they have been frustrated and upset. That doesn't make them right. And they did everything they went above and beyond. They hired an attorney to try and help them manage this. We heard that from the witness stand. Not an attorney from Hopkinsville. Not an attorney from Danville. I'm an attorney from Danville. Okay? They hired a guy out of New York City who goes on TV and does things like Sue's O.J. Simpson. Right? And they can hire whoever they want. But they put out billboards. They offered rewards. They were doing everything they could think of. They met with the Attorney General. I don't know how easy it is to get a meeting with the Attorney General. And now that Attorney General is the governor. And finally, Chris is charged in 2019 and dramatically arrested at the airport in front of his passengers. But that doesn't make him guilty. That makes him arrested. We heard some other folks come in, and they talked, other friends of the Phillips family, and friends of uh, Ed Dandrew. And I'd like to point out, you now Chris, he wasn't great friends with, with the Phillips. He knew them a little. They were neighbors. He said he'd gone over. Um, shot in the backyard a couple times, and it was a while back. He was friends with that. Not best friends or anything, but certainly friendly. Have a beer now and again, talk, wave. When folks pass away, People think about them differently. They talk about them differently. The folks who came in said what was their memory of conversations from 2015. I'm not suggesting that they're all a bunch of liars or anything like that. They may have exaggerated. Time just brings things to memory. But they came in here to try and help. They weren't trying to help us. They weren't trying to help me. They came in here to try and help the prosecution. But what did they really say? They said that they were nervous and worried about the upcoming court martial. I don't blame them. You know, I go to court. I'm used to court. But normal people aren't. I want to suggest to you that Calvin may have realized 
that he was in a little bit over his head dealing with Joan and dealing with that court martial. But what, one of the things that they didn't say, and I want to point this out, is that none of them suggested that there had ever been a threat of any kind or anything like that. This is not some situation where there had been threats and a buildup and any of that kind of stuff. There was no testimony to that because it didn't happen. I want to highlight a couple of the folks who came in in particular. First, let's talk about the Durhams. There are more Steve Durhams than I can shake a stick at. Um, I didn't even know until yesterday that there were three. Uh, so I'll be honest, I'm not sure standing here right now which Steve Durham is which. Um, but one Steve Durham came in here and testified, who I think is Biddle Steve. And he said, he wasn't really friends with Joan, didn't even know maybe she had a kid, maybe she didn't. I don't think that's very likely. We heard testimony yesterday from Amanda in the morning, and she said that middle Steve had actually worked on Joan's son's car and had come over and visited with him at her house. It's Pembroke, it's, it's less than a thousand people. And certainly there's been testimony from multiple people that those that the families were close. How close uh, was Joan with the Phillips? We know that they were close, and we know that everybody knew they were close. Because when the Phillips were killed and the police were at the crime scene. They made Ed Stokes leave. They made Ed Stokes leave because his brother was dating Joan. The only reason you would do that is because you're aware of how close people are. Otherwise, there'd be no conflict. You wouldn't need to send him away. How big must a conflict be if your brother's relationship with Joan Harmon means you shouldn't go or have anything to do with a Phillips house. That means it's a big conflict, and it means that everybody knows it. And we know that one of the Steve's, I believe the older Steve, went and talked to Joan's son and brought him a message from Joe. These folks all know each other. So why on the witness stand is he trying to deny that? The reason that people are dishonest sometimes because they don't want you to know the facts. I think the Durham's are. We heard his testimony. But the real person we need to focus in on for a second is Mr. Matlock. Mr. Matlock's testimony made no sense. Mr. Matlock's testimony is very suspicious. And why? Why was he here? It is a rare day that a witness on the witness stand says, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know how I got here. He told the story in here that he agreed he had not told anybody for five years. Thanks. I think that's right. More. That's weird. 
Somebody wanted him here in this room. Just like the shell case, adding a little frosting to the cake, pushing the ball a little bit closer to the goal line. You could. But his actual testimony made no sense. On the Saturday beforehand, which is a great memory, by the way, if you haven't told that story for five years. On the Saturday beforehand, coming out of, I think, he said he was on this field down here. He said, coming out of this area, he sees Chris around one. You know, we actually heard from Mr. Hammond what this area is. It's flooded by beaver dams. It's a flooded area. And according to Mr. Matlock, Chris is walking out of it wearing his bright yellow shirt. Doesn't make any sense. It's not believable that he would come here years later. But what's really telling is, Mr. Matlock doesn't know what we know, which is we have the actual phone records and uh, what you've heard this word a lot, the Celebrite report, which is the data. And we know that actually, Chris, had a meeting with his attorneys, right? And then had a one and a half hour long uh, phone call at the time that Mr. Matlock's saying he's over there. Someone wanted Mr. Matlock to come here and testify. And I don't think it was Mr. Matlock. He didn't look all that excited to be here. We also have other dishonest evidence in this case. There's some things that are fair and some things that aren't. I don't think at any time when video clips are being played for you that half the clip should be played. A video clip that shows somebody outside of a house when there was another clip that showed them leaving a few minutes earlier should have been played for you at the same time. Now we went back through and we found those and we played them for you. It's only fair that you have all the evidence. That's the only way you can make a decision. That's the only way you can understand what happened. We know from the testimony on this witness stand that there was a prosecution expert on cell phone location. We know there was testimony in order to get this charge in the first place. And we heard from the witness stand from Lieutenant Smith that he gave that testimony. You never heard the prosecution expert in this case. His name is Kevin Horan. You heard his name, but you never heard him 
on this witness stand. And Lieutenant Smith told you why. Because even though there was testimony in order to get the charge in the first place, that guy's report was wrong. It was all wrong. Lieutenant Smith said, I got better information later. That doesn't stop Mr. Martin. That doesn't stop Chris from getting charged and arrested. You heard John Reeves, our cell phone expert. We called our cell phone expert. We put our cell phone expert on the stand so you could hear. And he uh, and the prosecutor got to ask him any question they wanted. But you never got a chance to hear their expert because they knew it wouldn't do him any good because his results are garbage. And I asked, I asked all the questions for Mr. Reeves. And he told you what the cell phones could tell you about location, about activity, Let's talk about activity for a second. You know, there were claims made in their opening about big chunks of inactivity. But you know what? We heard from the witness stand that actually those chunks aren't that big. Now, I want to remind you that we all have inactivity. It doesn't mean we're committing a crime. Every time I'm not using my cell phone, I'm not committing a crime. It means I put my cell phone down. It means I put it on the charger. It means I'm living my life. But they want to suggest that every time that Chris isn't sending an email or did a text, he must be committing a crime. That's crazy. But they suggested big gaps. You heard on the witness stand that actually there was activity during a lot of those. One of the things that evidently the prosecution didn't know was the difference between a text message or an instant message. All right? During this the big gaps, there were 18 instant messages because those traveled with their data rather than text. Now there's a side of me that says, I don't need to tell you anything that you already heard. Then I get real nervous. I get nervous because I worry that we heard so much that I'll forget something, or you'll forget something. So if you're saying to yourself right now, I already know that, we said, God, shut up. It might be fair, okay? But I am trying to make sure that I hit all the things that I think are so important. Because after this, we don't get to talk. Then it's just you folks talking to, your, to yourselves. I'm going to ask for help. Yeah, I am. It is for me. I don't know if it is for them. Oh, that's a good one. I'm sorry. I think that's good. Okay.
we're talking about timeline, I think it's important to understand that there's evidence out there that is different than the timelines that you were suggested. So just taking a second to warm up. him there on the back. on the right on his back porch at 11:44 you heard his testimony he went that's when he went down and checked on the dogs he was out there for a minute you saw you saw him in the clip go out check on him come back in this is almost the exact same time over on Rose Town Road now the prosecution has suggested that what happened with the car happened at 2.30 in the morning. But I want to show you these clips from the surveillance camera at John Hummocks. And if you watch right here, you'll actually see smoke passing, what I believe is smoke, <coughs> passing in front of the camera. Remember Mr. Homick's home is not far. see coming from the left side and then going to the right. Especially here you can really see the smoke. That just keeps going in the same vein, and then a little bit later. <clears throat> this is almost one in the morning. That's not the only thing about the timeline that you were first presented with, and that's in your brain. Um, 
prosecution wants you to believe that Chris is making trip after trip after trip across that street. I'm seeing or it's pretty clear he's in the house. They're hanging out. They're doing normal stuff. The prosecution said, what exactly did you do? is that the kids were home too. Now of course, evidently, they couldn't remember that day super well, wish they had better memory of it. But we do know that they were home and in and out and around at the same time that this was supposed to be happening. It's unbelievable. Laura remembers that night. She doesn't remember exactly what they're doing every minute. Because who would? My wife gets mad at me because I'm sometimes forgetful about the even day of the anniversary. The prosecution suggests every time that someone does not, doesn't have a 100% digital footprint, that something may be going on. But the irony is that the, where were you on Mysterious Monday? Well, we found out. We looked through his, uh, the Selbright report, the data and everything, and we saw him. He went to his lawyers. His lawyer came in and said, he went to my office. He did errands. He was talking to his court martial attorneys. He was doing all the things that he should be doing. That timeline doesn't show a thing. There's nothing suspicious or incriminating at all. Because he didn't do anything. But let's talk for a second about the sort of thing that you'd expect to have seen, right? What about the science? What does the science tell us here? Now, the prosecution put up an expert to say that they did visual examination and that there were, out of a lot of hairs, there were some that were similar. Caucasian, older, and gray. They said color. Right. That's true as much of Mr. Moore's hair. It's true of lots of people's hair. And when they sent those hairs off to have the DNA examined, it turned out that a bunch of them were head hairs, Mr. Dansmer, as would be expected from his own car. But more importantly, every single one that had a result you can't test every single hair. Every single one that had a result was very specific, and it said, not Chris, not Chris, not Chris. They sent uh, other hairs to the FBI lab. And we heard those results. And everyone that they could get a result on, not Chris, not Chris, not Chris. They looked and they said, maybe 
he, well, they looked at, at other DNA, right? Excluded. They looked for anything incriminating from the Phillips, anything that was on, uh, on Chris's clothes, anything like that. Nothing. He said, maybe there's, there's blood on here. It wasn't blood on, on his shirt. And there was, there was nothing, which is exactly what you would expect when someone has not committed the crime. They looked at all the science, and the science came back negative. And we've already talked about this, the suspicious showcase. But let's talk for a second about the actual bullets. The bullets are what killed Calvin Phillips. I'm talking specifically about the ones that, um, that were tested by two sets of experts. Those bullets are not matched to this casing. And those bullets are not matched to the Glock firearms. Now we've heard that there's multiple forms of inconclusive. Heard that on the witness stand. But let's talk, just for a second, before we even talk about the final conclusion, let's talk about the reality and the actual evidence. Ballistics is a science. It's a science on purpose. This isn't some novel thing that we heard about for the first time here. They've been doing ballistics and ballistic science for years. And the marks on the bullets, the bullets that killed Calvin Phillips, and the marks on the test fires from the gun that was owned by Chris are simply not the same. And the most telling point is that the defense expert and the prosecution's expert both reached that conclusion. Now, could they 100% exclude them? No, because they have rules in their scientific spheres. Right? You could not 100% exclude them. But they both noted, and we heard testimony, that there were differences. There were striations that were different, scratches. They both explained how those happen. And the scratches on one are small. And the test fires, the scratches, are different. They both saw the same thing, that they were different. Now, the prosecution said, well, maybe there was something uh, that changed the gun. But both experts said there wasn't. And there was an explanation about not only was there no tampering with a gun or anything, but you were told why it would be obvious and easy to tell. Because the Glock 45 has a smooth sort of, I think you may have said, like a mirror. Right? And he looked. And so that's just nonsense. Both experts said there hadn't been anything done to it. And if there hasn't been anything done to it, then when they're fired, they should be the same if in fact, if in fact the bullets were fired from that gun, and they are. Because of science, I had to use the word unlikely. But I know what unlikely means. And it certainly isn't proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Unlikely means exactly what it sounds like. Probably not. 
And it wasn't just probably not just for, you know, because I feel that way. It's probably not for these reasons that were found by both experts. We don't convict people in America on probably not. Now we tried to get you all the evidence we could. Years had gone by, which always makes it hard for people to have perfect memories. And I, I think I said this to you in the opening. You know, in, in real life, when folks are living their life, they don't realize you're going to have to come back into a courtroom like this and recite chapter and verse and answer questions about it. If somebody grabbed me right now and said, hey, I need you to answer questions about November 18th, 2015, I have no idea. If somebody said you have to answer questions about November 18th, 2020, I wouldn't do that much better. You know, it's COVID. It's probably home. That's about it. The world's a messy place. In real life, you know, in this courtroom, sometimes we forget. And I think it's worth saying. In this courtroom, we have good lighting. We have good acoustics. There's a microphone to make sure everybody can hear. And if you didn't hear it, you can ask people to repeat it. Right? But that's not the way it is out in the real world. Chris did the best he could to answer questions from memory about years ago. Thankfully, we had the cell phone data, which was helpful. Other witnesses did the best they could to remember and answer questions from November 2015. And I think most of them did a pretty good job. So, what did Chris really do right, that week? We know. He's trying to figure out if maybe Thanksgiving was going to be switched to his house. He was trying to make sure that even though the court martial was coming up, that he still was able to do some kind of celebration with Laura. And he was working on getting ready for that court martial. That's what he was doing. We don't have to take his word for it because we heard witnesses say it. And we don't have to take their word for it when we have the data from his phone. He was living his life, not realizing that he'd ever be back in a room like this having to account chapter and verse. So on the day of the 18th, he goes to the base, he works on his case, he leaves a little bit uh, earlier so he can get home, because he knows more that it's one of the days that work comes home early too, so he can spend time, so he can live his life, so he can see his family, so he can try and focus on something for just that day, spend time with somebody he cares about. There have been suggestions, I mentioned this in the opening, that many of the things, the normal things, that Chris did are sinister. Right. Chris has a kerosene heater. Lots of people have kerosene heaters. Chris talked more about his kerosene heater. Right? Anybody should have to. But he walked you through it, told you um, 
And he busted the old one, had a new one. Hadn't been that cold that year, but it was cold that night. We heard that from a whole bunch of different people. You heard it from Lieutenant Smith. <coughs> and he fired up a kerosene heater. Now, Chris is an organized person. I'm not. Just be honest. Chris does stuff like tries to figure out the best way to uh, do his, do the heater and all that. I don't do stuff like that. I mostly turn stuff on and hope it doesn't break. If it does, I try and fix it and I do a bad job most of the time. So Chris explain that too. The kerosene heater is something that works pretty well, but it also has an element of danger to it. So Chris set an alarm. Set an alarm to check on it. New heater, the first time you run it during the year. They want you to believe that this is an alarm that he sets for himself to go commit what would be crime number three or four that day. Their version is that he's gone across the street, committed a murder, goes to work, goes back across the street, not sure why, right, goes back across the street, commits maybe two murders, goes back, goes back across the street because he's got to move some cars because he's got to hide the cars and hide the bodies and all this while he's hanging out with Laura, right, seeing the kids. He's got to do all that, still having some emails, still having some texts, still talking to people, right? And then evidently at night, according to the prosecutor, decides, before I get rid of the bodies, who knows where they are, who knows where these cars are, right? I'm gonna take a snooze? Is that, is that really what they're saying? That after this day-long crime spree, he decides to catch a couple of Z's before he's gonna wake up at one and then go out and set fire to a car with dead bodies in it. Doesn't make any sense. But that's what they want you to believe. If you think about what the prosecutor has told you, it's not supported by any evidence. And it doesn't make sense. He told you why that alarm really got set. You know? Chris walks his dog. Like everybody who has dogs. And he walks his dogs. And it's Pembroke, it's mostly rural. Uh, and it had been raining. You heard testimony from multiple people, it had been raining um, until sometime during the morning of the 18th. Not sure that we heard testimony about when the rain stopped. Um, it had been raining for multiple days uh, at that point. On the 19th, Chris walks Sarge, tries to take him to, the, to some of his regular places, but when they get there, it's just so muddy and gross, he tries to go someplace else. Prosecution said, aha, look, there's mud on his boots. There's going to be mud on the boots of every single person who walked the dog in Pembroke on the 19th. But wait, his gun is in his gun safe. That must mean that he committed the murder. But actually, it's the opposite.
when folks found out about the murder, his lawyers, not me, not us, the court martial folks, said, wait, this is now, this is remember later in the afternoon or early evening. If they got shot, is there any chance Joan has access to your to any of your guns? And he said, No. He said, Oh. Do you have any vehicles? And he said, Yes, I do. I have my my block in the Tacoma. And I said, Does she still have a key to that? And he said, Well, she used to. Yeah, probably. And they said exactly, they said, smart thing, why don't you go lock that up then? And he did. But the prosecutor wants you to think that that is the most suspicious thing. If, if Mr. Martin, Chris, was trying to Hide that thought in a million other places other than his own house. Doesn't make sense. But what does make sense, and what is true, is that his lawyer said, hey, you should go lock that up. Lock it up so no one can have access to it. Lock it up so Joan can't touch it. And that's what he did. Whoever committed these murders, what a terrible plan. What a mess. What a fool. What a terrible person. It is the sloppiest, stupidest thing I've ever heard. Going over, and this is the prosecutor's version, right? over and then going back to a crime scene where there's a dead body and then evidently sticking around there and then killing more people and then having to put them someplace and then having an incriminating car you know what that car is never over at Chris's house. Of course it wouldn't be. Why would it be? But I want to suggest to you, it probably went someplace. Someone's garage or someone's shop or someone's house with space for it. It went someplace. Whoever killed those people didn't just leave those bodies in a car for hours to be potentially found. Frances LaRock went back and she said, she went back a couple times. There are people doing stuff, they're moving cars. Right? We know they have to be. Joan, William Stokes, whoever has a lot they need to do. And Chris is at home. And we know that from his cell phone activity. We know that from uh, Laura. We know that from the testimony the kids talking about. But he was ever actually committing that crime. These crimes are going in and out. They're dropping evidence. They're spending time there. Testimony was that Calvin Phillips' body was moved. Somebody moved that body. Things are being moved around in that house. That takes time. 
and it's foolish. This is a dumb plan. Putting that subpoena out there is a dumb way of doing it. Going back and forth like that, going whoever went there in the morning, went there in the evening, and then somehow moved that stuff and then took a trip later on. Now, where were they going? Well, Chris isn't from Pembroke. He doesn't know everybody. The folks in Pembroke, all not everybody knows everybody, but they pretty close. When we heard him talking, I mean, folks know people in a small town. You want else they might know? Folks might know if you live in Pembroke, if you're a local, you might know where John Hommick has a burn pile, and his isn't a little, it's big. He described it as big. I don't know that that's where um, the people who committed the murder were headed, but it might be the sort of thing that you would know about if you were a local. Might be the sort of thing you would know about if your brother was on the volunteer fire department. And whoever was actually driving that car managed to go off the road. And then set fire to it. I wish we knew more about that, but we don't. But this sloppy mess of a crime spree was done by someone who was a fool. And frankly, when they're leaving things like this, they're treating the police like fools. So, let's talk about Joan again one last time. Prosecution talked about motive, means, and opportunity. Right. Did she have a motive to do this? I'll ruin your life. She has a motive to start a uh, court process one of multiple. And if she thinks it's falling apart and she thinks that Calvin is going to come in and testify in a way that undermines what she's doing, does she have a motive to kill him? I would suggest to you that her motive has more to do with framing. But it could be too hard. Does she have the means? Yes. We know she has guns. We know she has access and access with the key or access earlier to Chris's gun. And everybody has guns. If you want to have a gun, you can tell you. You have guns. Does she have opportunity? She lives nearby. I don't mean five seconds nearby, but Elkton is not far away. And we know she's not, we know she's not a good person. We know because we've heard about her behavior. We know because we've heard about her dishonesty. And we've heard her plan, which is to ruin his life.
she's dating someone who's a local, who's a truck driver. Who has no, uh, whose whereabouts are unknown except for about three and a half hours on the 18th. Drive to Bowling Green, which is not that far. You heard from Mr. Murray, half an hour unload, driving back. It takes a little bit longer because it's a larger truck. Okay, at half an hour. At an hour. And let's remember what Lisa Petrie said. I found that chilling. I really did. She said that Joan came in after the murders and was excited. It's somebody she worked with. She said Joan came in and was excited. And then she clarified, she said, not like scared, but excited. How excited? So excited that Lisa called the police. Now we didn't get to hear exactly what she said. Think about that for a second. If somebody you worked with comes into work and seems happy about a murder and seems so happy you call the police, that's pretty extreme. <coughs> so Joan has the motive, she has the opportunity, and she has the means. Her behavior beforehand shows that she's the sort of person who could do it, the sort of person who uses court to get back at people, to attack people. The sort of person who uses court is the same kind of person who would plant evidence. And we know that her behavior after is suspicious. And we know Joan had the phone. So I guess I just proved it, right? Means, motive, opportunity. Behavior. Right? I must have just proved that beyond a reasonable doubt. You can all go home. But I didn't. Her behavior beforehand, her behavior afterwards, her means, her motive, her opportunity are all there. But you know what? That's not Kentucky law. I know what I think. I know what I believe. I know what my guess is about what happened. I have a guess. It's a strong guess. I believe it. But you know what? I can't prove it to you. I can't prove it to you beyond a reasonable doubt. But by that same token, do we need to? That's a judge. There's a juror of needs. No. All right. Well, let's take a break. Okay, uh, juror needed to uh, take a break. Oof, what a what um, um, closing argument so far. Not finished. He's getting near his two-hour limit. Uh, Tom Griffiths, though, going through the case and using some emotion, some um, demonstratives, a very thorough cross uh, closing argument. Uh, they say that you know. 
if you're going over an hour, hour and a half, the only person listening to you is yourself, but I think he's pulling it off. It'd uh, be interesting to uh, hear um, what others think, but okay, but uh, that's, uh, let's bring in Eric Faddis, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor. Uh, Eric, is it getting too long? I mean, he seems, and we don't, we'll have, we have our eyes on the courtroom, so we'll get juror reaction, but from your position here, um, How's he, how's this close going, and and uh, is it too lengthy? You, you know, Ted, the concern with uh, a closing argument uh, at a length like this is that we. You have some very strong points, but when you're adding in all of this extra information over the course of hours, you you, you may be diluting the, the potency of the strongest points that you have. And, and I fear that that's what the defense counsel may be doing here. However, I think he was sort of coming to a crescendo there, and uh, it was uh, rather unfortunate timing that they had to take a break, uh, certainly scoring, scoring some points on the defense side as well, though. Yeah, and the juror obviously uh, raised his or her hand and said, I'm sorry, but I need to uh, uh, need a little break. So the judge is allowing it. And now we're going to see, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. The, the state is next and last. Normally our viewers see the state go first, the defense, and then the state gets the last word with a rebuttal. In Kentucky, it just goes defense and state. What are you expecting from the Commonwealth of Kentucky? Where do they go? They seem to be back on their heels. This is one case uh, that, uh, unlike most cases that we cover, um, this one seems as though reasonable doubt has crept in to a very high degree. Yeah, you know, Ted, I, I think that the, the prosecution's case is a bit thin on the evidence here. They've got some circumstantial stuff that they've presented, and so they've sort of put the dots on the board, and what they need to do in this closing is really connect those dots in a persuasive way, really bring home the, the, the uh, central thesis of their case uh, in a way that's compelling and a way that draws the conclusion so that the jury is relatively certain that this defendant did commit these acts as charged. At the end of the day, you've, the jury's been sort of given, oh, let's go back in. But my case against John Harmon, it's just that, to, to guess. I can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. The law says that I'm not supposed to. But by the same token, the prosecution's case falls the same way. For the same reason that I can't tell you that Joan or William Stokes committed this crime. The prosecutor doesn't know who committed this crime. Because I have no hard evidence. I have guesswork and I have speculation. And I know what it's based on. But at the end of the day, it's just that. When the prosecution has some evidence, they have speculation and they have guesswork. The judge told you earlier today that your service and the law is the bedrock of our democracy. I agree. You know, we put on all the evidence that we could. Chris didn't have to testify. You all know that. You all know about the right to remain silent. He could have, he could have sat in that chair and had his lawyers do what we're talking for. But he wanted to go up here. He wanted to tell you, even though he knew that the prosecutor was going to throw every question come up with that. Because he wanted you to know. Well, I 
not been uh, here. I told you I had uh, three, three little girls. While I have them here, um, they sent me a care package, which just arrived. And I have a back in the hotel. But there was a card, and it was because I wanted to see what they said. I thought maybe they had a piece of art or something like that. And I just wanted to see. And it was a card for me. But I was surprised that there was also uh, there was a note for Chris, actually, in it. And uh, I tried to explain to them what I do. It's a weird job, maybe. And uh, I think they understand. My oldest is 15. She definitely understands. But the uh, the note they wrote to him, and they've never met him, of course, uh, says, Dear Christian, we hope your trial is going well. It says, We're cheering for you, and you're our favorite pilot. And I looked at that this morning. I actually opened that this morning at the hotel. And I thought about that. And I thought it was worth sharing with you. You know, There's a lot more to somebody than what is talked about in a courtroom like this. There's a lot more to Chris than these charges. We have tried very hard to share some of that with you, and I hope we've succeeded. If we haven't, I apologize. But it is my hope that we told you what you needed to know and that we explained what you needed to understand well enough because you're going to have to go back after the prosecutor's finished. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Judge. At the end of the day, once you remove the planted evidence, once you ignore the desperate evidence, this case is no evidence. And the reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, is because Chris Martin is not guilty. Please return him to his family.